The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello and good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. You've landed at the Co uh, CAF COVID Weekly Roundup. Uh, today is April 9th, 2021. Uh, my name is Jason Belden. I'm the Director of Emergency Preparedness for CAF. Uh, and uh, I don't I don't think we're going to have uh, Patty today, but we have no AFLs or real big regulatory things to to uh, review, although there were changes within existing AFLs, and I want to kind of point that out to you. But uh, so I don't think we'll have Patty on today. Um, and then we're going to do a deeper dive into the after action re review. I know we spent a very short period of time going over what goes into an after action and, um, and uh, you know, where to pull the information from. Uh, if you look in today's handouts, we're going to refer to uh, two of the handouts today pretty extensively. And so the handouts for the 2017 through 2022 healthcare um, capabilities uh, workbook, that's a, a very large PDF. Um, I'm going to kind of show you where to gather information from that to take and put into the after action template. But we'll go over that in a second. And then if you hadn't heard, uh, surveys are beginning to resume and we have uh, confirmation that that is actually occurring, not just um, the uh, uh, facility reported incidents or complaint visits, but uh, traditional recertification surveys um, are starting back up in areas of the state. So I wanna make you aware of that if you weren't already, uh, it's definitely a change to your um, operations for sure, uh, they're not gonna be looking at mitigation uh, plan elements anymore. Okay, so as an introduction, um, the speaker's opinions expressed are, are their own and they may not reflect CAF's official position. Um, these webinars are brought to you as a part of a grant funded program um, through the hospital preparedness program, um, which we may change, end up changing to the healthcare preparedness program, but uh, nonetheless, that grant pays for uh, these webinars. I have no financial conflicts and I'll be the only speaker on the webinar. The intent of the webinars is to give you a situational report for the current response with a little bit of forecasting uh, and best practices. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a situation uh, report um, and some situational awareness. Uh, and then we're gonna really uh, concentrate on best practices on how to do the after action. All right. All right, so I mentioned uh, we didn't have any AFL since the last time we met, but we did see some changes within existing AFLs um, or one uh, specific change that I wanna mention here, and that's the AFL 21-08.2 uh, as it relates to quarantine. Um, not a lot of the, the guidance uh, within the AFL changed, but the AFL refers people to the CDC guidance for quarantine after travel, especially for fully vaccinated and non-vaccinated or previously positive uh, folks. Uh, and, and a couple of weeks ago, it was big news because the CDC had not um, really addressed the vaccination status of travelers. Uh, and things like that. But they have changed that, and that change occurred on uh, April 1st, and that's not an April Fool's joke, I don't think. Um, and the link to the guidance is there uh, under the blue highlight. So for fully vaccinated people, they do not need to quarantine after travel, and testing is not recommended. And so that's for fully vaccinated uh, uh, staff that are coming back from like vacation and things like that, or if they've been previously positive within the last 90 days, um, they do not need to quarantine after travel or be tested, um, or there's a recommendation to test. Now, obviously, uh, we have a testing requirement that, that's universal across all healthcare workers. So when they come back uh, from vacation or travel, we're gonna add them back into our testing pool at the next test, test collection day. Um, or if you're using any of the antigen POC devices, you can uh, utilize that on their first day back if you want to. Um, for non-vaccinated folks or folks that have been pre previously positive greater, uh, I'm sorry, that should say greater than 90 days, are still required to quarantine after travel. So uh, the recommendation is still to test them and, um, and to quarantine them after uh, travel. So um, we wanna make sure that we align our uh, 
our operations with that. So we're not going to quarantine those folks, uh, staff members that have taken vacation and come back if they've been fully vaccinated. Uh, there's some recommendations for testing in that. But like I said, I we're mostly concerned about the quarantine uh, guidance as it relates because CD, CDPH has told us that for the traveler guidance, we were to follow the general guidance for the uh for the general population, and that's uh, and that's where we're at there. So, um, in terms of the AFL, where we anticipate some possible changes coming. Now, this has not changed yet, but we do anticipate some changes to group dining um, and group activities within the facility uh, to possibly change. And those changes would come under AFL 2022.6, the one that talks about visitation and all that other stuff. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, well, there's a lot of difficulties with operationalizing, um, you know, six foot distance within dining rooms where we're trying to get everybody re-engaged. And, um, and we're scheduled to speak with the department next week about, um, you know, what kind of flexibility can we have or can we build different kind of operations for vaccinated residents, for unvaccinated residents uh, and things like that. So those uh, conversations are ongoing. I, I realize this is incredibly hard to operationalize these these changes. There's so many moving parts to this AFL. I think the thing we want you guys to concentrate on, because we see a lot of questions in terms of asking specifically, can I do this and can I do that? Within the AFL, there is a, a ton of flexibility for you to um, um, fit it to your specific needs. And so if you're still operating in incident command, you should have your safety officer doing an assessment of really all of the all of the elements that could put uh, uh, folks at risk. So think about the space in which they're, uh, they're going to be uh, visiting. Um, think about how they're going to be greeted, where they're going to be greeted. I've had a lot of questions about, you know, people uh, talking about, uh, I can't, um, I have difficulty controlling uh, folks um, compliance with infection prevention and control measures. And I'll just say if one, um, you know, I think as you, I would schedule, you know, this is my opinion. I would have a, a visiting schedule that works for your building it says, this is the manner in which we can do it safely. This is the number in which we can do it safely. These are the times in which we can do it safely and stick to that kind of format. And then you can say, well, gosh, when we call to schedule these appointments, do is there some indication that this person is going to cause a problem when they get there? And when they get there, do we have a process to greet them before they uh, gain access to the building and put folks at risk? And those are the kind of questions you want to answer. It is always within your um, your authority to deny somebody a visit if um, if it creates a safety uh, concern for not only their loved one, but for the other residents and for the staff in the building. We have to think about it in terms of protecting the entirety of everybody rather than uh, meeting an individual's needs. And, and I know that's a difficult conversation to have with families. They're not going to be happy with it, especially if their their family member's been vaccinated. They're going to go, wait a second, that doesn't fly because everybody else on the planet doesn't have these same restrictions. But you have to understand and you have to explain it to these folks that we quantify risk differently for our residents. The risk factor for them is exponentially higher than it is for the general public. These folks do really poorly if they get COVID. So we have to be as careful as we can, and we have to be the last persons, the last people to remove these restrictions. And I think that's, if you can develop that into your messaging and say, we we understand, we know we're going to do the best we can to accommodate you and your loved one. We realize how important it is uh, to engage and, and um, with our families and things like that. So all of those things are incredibly important, but they're one aid to protecting folks' lives. And so we have to consider that first. Um, so when we think about the exposure risk to non-vaccinated distance, uh, the, the time in which they're uh, exposed, meaning the time in which they're close to other people who we don't have an idea of whether they've been either 
vaccinated, uh, tested, um, you know, things like that. Distance is obviously key. We want, uh, you know, minimum six foot distance. And I'm thinking more in terms of, you know, in room indoor visitation where you're in a resident room. If one of them's not vaccinated and they, that family member wants to have a visit in that room, I'm not certain that's safe uh, for the other resident that's not vaccinated. And so in that instance, if there's any manner in which you can accommodate visiting with it without putting that other resident at risk, that's what we want to do. And we want to think about fresh air, not as the solution necessarily, or, well, I, I'll just say dilution is the solution. So whenever we think about air in our building, the ability to maximize fresh air increases those air changes. And while it doesn't necessarily remove the virus from an, from the air, it does dilute the air so that the hope is that we dilute it enough that we were not uh, inhaling infectious par particles. So all of those things need to be considered about where you're going to have your uh, visitation space, along with all of the infection prevention and control measures, screening at the door, uh, temp screening, all that stuff still has to stay in place. We've got to keep that stuff for a little bit longer. I know it's uh, it's laborious and uh, and we're just ready to be done, but we got to keep that stuff up. So I wanted to cover that stuff and let you know that within the AFL, it gives you lots of flexibility to to meet the needs and. And if you have specific questions of whether this is going to fly, let me let me know, and and, and I'm happy to answer those if, if you want. All right, um, and we have lots of other, uh, you know, uh, really capable staff at, at CAF, so we could engage uh, Deanne or Patty, and they can give you or Claire, and they can give you really um, helpful guidance as well. So, with that, uh, let's hop to the talking about the uh, the template um, for the uh, after action report. Um, the way to utilize this after action uh, uh, template, we've created like the first couple pages have real standard language that we're going to keep that language in there. You're just going to put your facility information in the highlighted areas and put it on your letterhead and things like that. What we're going to do in that template is we're going to refer and I, I, for you, those of you that listened to this a few weeks ago, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into this. So if, if some of this is repetition, uh, you know, forgive me. Uh, I just want to catch everybody. Not everybody's really strong on this. And, and this is a complex um, kind of set of actions that you guys will need to take. Um, and my guess is very few of you have done this before and certainly not to the level that you, you're probably going to do it uh, after this event. Um, so when we pick how we look at uh, reviewing our objectives and actions, the the national ASPR or the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response, they set out these things called core capabilities, and there's four core capabilities. Those core capabilities are foundation for healthcare and medical readiness, healthcare and medical response coordination continuity of healthcare services delivery and medical surge. So we're going to look at objectives and activities in each one of those four buckets. And I'm, I picked out ones that I think we should be as a, a profession. Doesn't mean that your individual facility uh, is going to identify as this is the most important things to look at, but I wanted to throw out kind of a, an overview of all the categories that are kind of available for you to review. And then we'll talk about, you know, what within those objectives um, you should be looking at. So um, most of the objectives in that, um, that 2017 through 2022, uh, well, not all of the objectives are listed out. Um, now, if you had objectives early on in the response and those objectives are, are not necessarily um, termed the same things, Look through, as we go through this, I want you to kind of say, well, this was my objective, and this is kind of how it fits into the, the overarching or the objectives the federal government has set out as saying, you know, these are objectives we should have as a healthcare organization. So I'm going to go over those and, and kind of point you to the ones that I think you, you should be taking a look at. When we, um, um, when we use our response activities, um, 
from uh, 2020, we're going to kind of score them in, in a manner. So on the template, there is an actual portion of the form that asks for a score. And um, it says analysis of core capabilities. And you're gonna pick the objective, put up whatever objective that is into the table. You're gonna list what core capability that objective fell under. So one, two, three, or four. And then you're just gonna score yourself. Did you perform it without challenges? Did you perform it with some challenges? Did you perform it with major challenges? Were you unable to perform it at all? And so that's gonna give you a score. Um, and then once you've kind of put that, that's the easy part. Once we've kind of put that into the bucket, then we're going to kind of draw down real in detail on, on uh, strengths and areas of improvement. And I will, I'll, I'll just talk about like how we're gonna, what buckets we're, we're gonna put these things in. Um, and I'll give you some of the ideas that you can look at while you're looking at these um, uh, kind of objectives. And so let's, let's take a look at the first capability, the Foundation for Healthcare Medical Readiness, Capability One. Now within the, these capabilities, they have multiple objectives. I pulled up the objectives that I think are most likely to apply uh, for you guys to fill in uh, that category. Um, and these are the objectives and typical activities within these objectives that are likely to apply to your response. So let's say objective two in capability one is called identifying risks and needs. And so throughout the response, did you assess regional healthcare resources. Things like, where can I get PPE? Where can I get staffing? Uh, things like that. Did you prioritize the gaps that you have, your resource gaps, and what were the mitigation strategies that you took um, to overcome those resource gaps? That's another thing that you can look at. Did you do well in that? Did you do poorly? Uh, how can you improve? Those are the, the kind of questions we want to ask ourselves under this category. Assess and identify regulatory compliance requirements. This has been a huge one during this response. I don't think any of us realize that clinical guidance was gonna come in the form of regulatory requirements and they were going to be blended um, into uh, guidance documents where some part of the document would be guidance and some would be regulatory compliance. So as you look at activities within that, um, you know, how did you assess the compliance uh, or uh, regulatory compliance? Did you have a process to maintain constant situational awareness with these regulatory compliance requirements? Things like that. Now, within that, that giant hand, handout, the 2017 through 22, uh, 22 capabilities handout, it, it gives some kind of ideas of things you can be looking at. But when you read this, it's you'll read that this is not just written for a healthcare organization or a hospital or a nursing home to be able to, to pull this information out of. This is meant for everybody in the healthcare spectrum. So as you read these things, they may not line up exactly with activities that you actually took. But I think if you use your analytical brain, you could say, Look, you know, this is talking about the healthcare coalition's ability to um, assess regulatory compliance. But at the outset, I set this as an objective for me to be able to maintain that situational awareness. And uh, here's here's the process I did. Um, did I do it well? Were there gaps in it? Things like that. So those are all activities within that objective that you really should be looking at now. After action reporting and improvement planning, generally because um, of the length of time and the, the diligence that we want you to take in really diving deeply into the strengths and failures of, of the objectives that you set out, um, we're gonna say that, you know, after this, you can probably do a review of each objective that you set out or a review of each one of these activities. And I certainly, would love to do, love for you to uh, dedicate some time on doing that. But in reality, this takes a long time to do, especially uh, when you're collating and gathering information to, to build a report that says, 
these were the resource gaps and these were the mitigation strategies and this is when it changed and this is how I changed it and this is my this was my process um, along with how you're going to do it better next time. Um, so the whole thing is not just gathering where we did it well, it's we want to do it where we did it poorly and so that improvement plan is a big portion of it. In terms of uh, Manhapta capability two, so in capability one, this is I think the most common objective and it has the activities within it that are most likely to apply that you should be looking at or may have had gaps for you. Um, in terms of capability two, healthcare and medical response coordination. Um, the second objective in capability two is utilize information sharing procedures and platforms. Um, did you develop information sharing procedures between you and uh, public health or you and um, the district office and, and things like that? Those are um, uh, examples of information sharing uh, that, that maybe you developed during this or maybe that were developed during this um, uh, that were had some gaps or you had some strengths and weaknesses you want to you want to dive into. Utilizing communication systems and platforms. Did you have issues with your technology and being able to, let's say you're in Los Angeles and you want to take a look at uh, your ability to respond um, uh, or to get signed up through uh, CARE and CalVax. And maybe that was a huge pain point for you guys and there were delays that caused uh, because of the, the the system and the platform in which they use that um, did you uh, were there folks that didn't get their vaccine uh, as quickly as they could have as a result of that that would be a, a really good um, failure or, or kind of gap that we would want to um, identify now whether we could do an improvement plan on that when when we have to rely on other folks uh, to do that I don't know um, but certainly we can uh, develop our ability um, to maintain that situational awareness and have a process to train our staff on new technologies that come out during the middle of a disaster in order to be able to respond to public health uh, requests. So that could be like a, uh, a strength, a weakness, and an improvement plan kind of all built into one. And, um, and, and I... I'm sorry if I forgot to mention this, but we want to minimize this to three to five for the report. We don't want to go on and on and on forever on these um, on this review. On the and so the capability to the healthcare and medical response coordination has a lot. This is the real meat of how we respond to disasters. So I imagine there's going to be lots of activities in here that you could potentially look at. And I'm just picking out the ones that I think um, you guys should review and the gaps that I've seen uh, and kind of the weaknesses I've seen are all relate to uh, in, in some of these key areas. Objective three, we would wanna look at coordinating response strategy, resources and communications. So did you identify and coordinate resource needs during an emergency? Yes, absolutely. Each each and every one of us did that. Um, this is another one of those. Uh, you know, did you um, did you gauge where you could buy PPE and things like that, and where you could get it from? Um, it's possible you could do coordinated incident action planning with your um, with your health department. Now, one of the goals of the healthcare coalitions throughout the country is to coordinate incident action planning during emergencies. And I'm sad to say that did not really, um, it did not really occur during this emergency. And we really didn't have any incident command from a public health standpoint to be able to do that. So I, you know, for me, this is a huge one, uh, a, a failure point on the, the failure of, um, public health both at a local level and a state level to be able to support us because we did not have coordinated incident action planning across the healthcare spectrum which could have led to a uh, reduction in the loss of life there's no doubt in my mind that a, a more coordinated approach would have uh, done that and if we were all working from uh, the same set of objectives we could have all implemented the same mitigation strategies to meet those and we didn't and uh, so we had inconsistent 
response across the healthcare spectrum. Now, how you quantify that into how it affected your building, that's really where, where we want to say, look, uh, we were not giving, getting incident action planning guidance. We re redid our own incident action planning uh, during this emergency. And our goal or our improvement plan is to better engage other healthcare wow. coalition members so that in the future, uh, we're not working in a silo. We're working as a part of a coalition altogether. So that would be an example of an improvement plan that you guys can do outside of what the, the, the counties and the state have to do better. But what we can do better uh, is, you know, address those uh, kind of facility specific information that starts with the planning and and really getting engaged with this with this coalition of folks uh, before the next disaster happens. Another activity you could look at is communication with your healthcare workers, uh, non-clinical staff, patients, and visitors during an emergency. This is always a big one. Um, certainly, if you want to look at strengths and weaknesses in terms of, uh, you know, we hear from uh, uh, resident families and patient advocates who who said that communication has been a really, really poor. Now, please don't take this personally. It might not apply to your facility, but there are certainly a, a a significant percentage of facilities that felt so overwhelmed um, by their workflow that they did really poor uh, in communicating with family members and their staff uh, about uh, elements that went around this um, disaster. And I, I think this is, every one of us can do better on communicating um, with folks, our CAF included, the CDBH included. We just, you know, Take a non-biased um, approach at looking at uh, how you provided uh, information to your staff and um, your residents and your resident family members and really, uh, you know, take a good look at this. I think we can all do better in this. Um, there, there could be, you know, some real, real key things that you should do from you know, here on out during emergencies, you need to have a point of contact for family members to get a hold of somebody. You need to talk about recorded uh, a technology to be able to have recorded messages that give frequent updates on your um, on your phone lines and things like that. All of these things that you, if you have not done that, could be great improvement plan items uh, to build into your emergency plan if this ever happens again. Uh, in terms of capability three, um, one of the main objectives here is to identify essential functions for healthcare delivery. And so that maintains key functions within the building that you needed to uh, make sure that uh, that were operational for the entirety of the disaster or, or pandemic, regardless of um, the, you know, regardless of of what was existing. In your building. Sorry, I lost my um, my place here, and I was going to read off the managing key functions. So, but th think about you know it's staffing, it's physical plant, it's um, it's all the infection prevention and control measures that were set up at the door, um, all kinds of different things that you would want to be looking at. So if you're looking at that handout for the capabilities handout. Within that objective uh, and the activities for maintaining key functions, there's a number of things that are listed out that you can look at. The list was so long, I didn't want to attach it all here, but I think this is there's a lot of meat in that. So if you're looking through there uh, to pick out something to review in your operations, I think that's a good one. Uh, moving on in capability three, there's um, two more objectives. Um, that objective three, without a doubt, I think. For most of us, uh, is, is going to be a big point um, that we have to look at um, is assessing the supply chain integrity and our ability to access PPE, um, and then uh, you know assess and address equipment supply and pharmaceutical requirements as the as the uh, guidance changed. How did we change uh, and address those uh, issues? Objective five, protect worker safety. This is, um, 
I think um, many of you are going to get uh, visits from OSHA inspectors. This is um, uh, th this is the objective around protectors uh, protecting worker safety and health. Um, so within that objective, um, there are really three uh, kind of things that you should be looking at. And um, did you distribute resources required to protect the healthcare workforce? And you know, did you have were you able to meet that needs? And so think about it. Was this a strength for you? Was it a weakness for you? Was it a weakness at the beginning? And then you implemented mitigation uh, strategies to overcome that, like you sourced other PPE and things like that. Those can all go into your improvement plan. Just because you improved it in the middle of the response doesn't necessarily uh, mean that you wouldn't include it in your uh, improvement plan. You want to make sure, though, that this, whatever it is, is uh, sticks. So if you develop the process and you develop new relationships uh, that are gonna stay in place, then yes, that's a part of your improvement plan. If you developed a mitigation strategy of, um, you know, um, searching for new PPE vendors every week during the disaster, which some of you may have done, maybe even more frequently than that, um, that's not a sustainable uh, kind of improvement plan. So we wouldn't want to tie it into a temporary measure. We want to tie it into our improvement plan into something that is is permanent and uh, sustainable that we can do uh, for here on out. Did you, um, other activities under the objective, did you train and exercise to promote uh, responder safety and health? Did you do fit testing? Did you... Um, did you uh, teach donning and doffing? Did you teach hand hygiene? Did you teach, uh, you know, all of those things um, in terms of onboarding or in-servicing folks that um, have, have, are new to uh, respiratory protection, things like that. Did you develop uh, healthcare worker resilience? So think more rather than physical tools to help them. Did you um, uh, do something to... Uh, uh, deal with their behavioral health or mental health? Um, did you develop tools that would um, uh, promote folks coming to work? Did you do? Did you incorporate tools that promoted healthy living at home? Um, you know, all of those kind of things go into healthcare worker resilience. It's not just did we give them the PPE, but did we try to help them um, you know, be more resilient personally so that they could be functional at work. And uh, and some of you guys have done really well on that. And some of us, this is a gap where we've we've been in it ourselves. And we're um, I, I've talked to some administrators and they're going, where's my behavioral health or where's my mental health and who's coming to rub my shoulders or patting me on the back? And I, I get that. This is a. Uh, you know, as you, you as the leader, you got to take a look at how we can um, best keep these folks resilient and at work beyond just their uh, their physical health, but their mental health is very important to being able to provide good care to our residents. So we want to do that. So this is a good one. I think we can look at it. Certainly, I think we can probably get better on it's um, there's been a, a small amount of support from other entities, I know we've had some education on this and some other folks are, but really I don't, you know, when we're all involved in this, I, I think we're all just waiting to for this to shake out to see how uh, to respond to folks. Um, at this point, I think folks are, are numb, um, but in the future, uh, I know we lost a lot of uh, healthcare workers, either, you know, uh, at the beginning because they were scared or what, but, you know, I think we can do better about the resilience side of uh, our healthcare workforce. Um, that's, those are good items for an improvement plan. I think it will help us in, in um, future pandemics. All right, so I went over these uh, the first three, and now I want to talk about capability four. And and I, uh, you know, capability four is more medical surge, and you may or may not have done this, um, but certainly. Uh, you know, medical surge planning um, means that you're you're thinking about staff, space, and supplies uh, in a disaster. 
Um, so did you incorporate uh, a medical surge plan? Um, I know many of you did. I, I've talked to folks that have said I took a rehab room and I turned that into my COVID you know, positive room, or I turned that into my, uh, my new uh, quarantine uh, zone or, or whatever. If you did that, those are great elements we want to look at. Um, in terms of responding to a medical surge, we want to think um, there are a number of activities within that objective, uh, too. Um, the second activity is implement medical response, uh, response. And so think about those cohorting zones and staffing and things like that. What did that look like? Were there strengths that you identified? Were there weaknesses? Were, uh, and how can we improve on that? If this happens again, think of another ATD that ha that comes around or some kind of emerging infectious disease that transmits through short range aerosols without anybody having any symptoms. And so give yourself that thing and go, if this same thing happened again, would I be any better now than I would have been in March of last year? Um, what are the things that I implemented midstream? And were they effective? Did they actually work to reducing or eliminating uh, the risk? And in some cases, I think they did. In some cases, you may not have the data. You may say, well, I, I put masks on everybody in April, uh, but I still had an outbreak in July, right? Does that mean the masks weren't working? Mm, maybe, maybe not. Um, it may be, um, you know, uh, you had a, you know, you had a, a staff that had less diligent about mask use. Maybe you have a high population of folks with dementia and the residents were, were wearing masks and you can't get them to wear masks. Those are all kinds of really elements you want to look at. But when you think about, you know, an improvement plan for these things, you want to think about were there things I missed? Were there things I had to implement for a temporary measure that I need to now make permanent? Um, and those are the things we want to put into the improvement plan. And so as I'm explaining all these things, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, this is a lot, a lot, a lot. I'm looking at every single minute element of my response. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm giving it merit and I'm, I'm setting up, uh, a timeline for an improvement plan on these specific issues. And, and um, that's why we want you to really concentrate on like three to five um, responses. So I apologize guys, forgive me. And so when we look at each one of these um, objectives, we want to, how did we respond to behavioral health needs during a medical surge response? And I want to say, not just from, a, these are things I guarantee you we can do better, especially on engaging uh, residents uh, through uh, from isolation. Because if this ever happens again, I don't foresee, um, you know, from a, a global perspective, whether the response would be managed much differently than it is. I think in future pandemics. Now, maybe it'll change, but uh, I think it's likely that we would have these stringent or very strict infection prevention and control measures that would do the exact same thing and they would isolate and really be harmful uh, for some residents. I don't think, I think the risk uh, is so great to life that we, we kind of went over the behavioral health needs of our residents. And I think, um, as an improvement plan or some of the things that I, I don't think we've done well on. Um, and I, I'll say this is not everybody, uh, so please don't take this personally. If you've spent a lot of time on this, you, you may feel um, defensive about how, how you met the behavioral health needs of your residents. But um, there are some very early indications and some studies that have been done that shows some really bad, uh, you know, kind of outcomes or, you know, some of the, metrics that we use to measure ourselves have really declined across the nation as a result of the, uh, you know, those stringent infection prevention and control measures. So while we're protecting people's life, we're really uh, um, 
not doing so well with the behavioral health needs of our residents. And so we, this is one of those things I think we could uh, we could all stand to do better on. Um, and uh, and really, the hard part is you have no outside of those measures from CMS, you have no individual kind of metric to kind of gauge this stuff. So it's it really it's really important that you take a critical look at your your own response as it relates to individual uh, residents. And is there something that we can do better? Is there a systemic process that we can do better for meeting the behavioral health needs of our residents? Um, if you didn't know, I'm super passionate about this. I, you know, I, I think we can all figure out how to protect people's lives um, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, you guys as clinicians and uh, folks in, uh, in this profession could figure that out quick. It's the, the non-tangible things that we can't really see that we know based on kind of data after the fact that these behavioral health needs can uh, manifest themselves into uh, physical ailments and uh, uh, decline of, of the residents. So um, I think it's super important. So anyways, the next activity we wanna uh, look at is how did we enhance our infectious disease preparedness and surge response? Um, you want to look at, this is another good one, full, chock full of information on how we can do better uh, in terms of, now I think this, a lot of this, um, you know, kind of boils down to how we were gathering the information, but if the information was incorrect, uh, what what did we do and how did we resolve those issues and were we getting conflicting information from um, multiple agencies and how did we how did we resolve that was that a strength was it a weakness if it was a weakness what is our improvement plan for uh, improving that uh the next time and like i said with that because that um kind of traditionally those incident action plans and that that clinical guidance um during disasters or pandemics should come from our public health agencies um and uh, they did not act in a coordinated manner in, in which to give us those kind of um, uh, direct guidance. So I think that's a gap that maybe we won't be able to fill, but we can certainly identify that that was a, um, a weakness. And in our improvement plan, we would want to maintain, have a process of maintaining uh, constant situational awareness during disasters. That's, um, that's a pretty important one. Uh, did you do you want to look at um, your ability to distribute medical countermeasures, quote unquote, you know, meaning the vaccine during your medical surge response? And then for some of you, I know that you had issues with mass fatalities. If you want to look at um, uh, that activity within that objective, that would be something, um, especially if you, you know, could not get anybody, uh, you couldn't get any mortuaries to come take your folks and you had to rely on the coroner or something, somebody like that. Um, or, uh, if you had issues um, managing mass, mass fatalities and uh, if you, you know, had strengths in there, that's okay. You don't, you, you don't have to list this out, but uh, if there were gaps and uh, let's say, uh, you know, you had uh, 10 or 12 folks and that had passed away and you could not, um, and you could not find somebody to take the bodies and you didn't have a plan for mass fatalities, that would be a gap, uh, you would, a weakness you'd want to identify. You'd want um, to incorporate mass fatality planning into your emergency operations plan. Um, easy improvement plan for that is just to go download the CAF mass fatality, uh, you know, kind of template and and uh, and you're, you would really be uh, kind of done with that or cost, customize it for your own facility. But there are a lot of these things with the improvement plan that you'll be able to that you'll be able to um, uh, accomplish with tools and things that we've uh, created on our uh, on our website. So I know I took a uh, half an hour or 40 minutes to really dive deeply into uh, after action reporting and improvement planning. Hopefully that answered some of your questions on how to get the information from that. Uh, that handbook, put it into the template. I've given you the objectives that I think you should be looking at. There, certainly there are more within there, but I think those, the ones that we covered, cover 
the 98% of your response or 95% of your response. And they're really the meat of where you should be looking at uh, for reviewing your activities. So with that, I'm going to hop to uh, questions, see if we have any questions in the question and answer box here. So the first question is, can you confirm the mitigation plans are no longer being surveyed but are still required? The AFL doesn't address it to void the 2020. Um, yeah, hi, uh, and that question was from Deb Friedman. Yes, so that's what we've been told is the mitigation plan surveys will no longer be uh, in place. So they're not going to be looking at the elements within that mitigation plan. Although they did say they were going to have an infection prevention and control focus to the surveys. What that means, I don't know. Um, but this, you know, I'm with you, Deb, and I think we're all sitting here going, well, you know, you've got AFLs that are still in effect and they have operational guidance on how we do things that also tie into the mitigation plan. And so when we talk to CDPH, they're going to have to divorce some of those two or, or clean up the AFLs into this is what stays even when you're not in a mitigation plan. As of yet, that, that document does not exist. Um, and so my hope is that we can work with them to kind of flesh those things out. Next question, does it change the treatment um, of a fully vaccination person if the travel was, travel is international? Uh, great question, and no, I reviewed the CDC guidance um, and it's linked in that, uh, that link um, uh, on the slides. Let me, let me actually see if I can go back to that slide. But on the, on the link itself, um, it, it goes into both, um, whoops, there it is there. It goes into both uh, international and domestic travel. It does not um, differentiate, although they do have some recommendation, recommendations for international travel on testing, um, but for fully vaccinated people after international travel, it's not recommended that they quarantine, uh, or if they've been previously positive within the last 90 days. Um, you would wanna put them right back into your testing pool, and so whenever the next date is do you start for you to start testing, that would be perfect. Um, regarding the after action plan, a lot of the disaster craziness surrounded government miscommunication and miscoordination. Would we or how would we account for that in the after action plan? I think um, in the objective where, where a, a part of your uh, gap um, or your weakness relies on, um, on miscommunication uh, from, from government uh, or miscoordination from government entities. I think what I would do for an improvement plan is one, I would have, I would set out a plan um, to build relationships um, during the planning process for everybody within my healthcare continuum. So um, now we have things called healthcare coalitions. That's nationally, there's healthcare coalitions in every community across the country. And in uh, California, our healthcare coalitions consist of mostly hospitals, uh, and that's the problem. And so this m kind of miscoordination is this disjointed approach between the folks in public health and an acute spectrum versus all the other folks on the healthcare spectrum that aren't really engaged in the planning and coordinating process. And this miscoordination or miscommunication really is because those folks don't understand what happens at the ground level or operational considerations within our space of healthcare. As scary as that sounds, folks in public health at a community level are really unlikely to understand your operations as a nursing home. Now, if you didn't know that before the disaster, you really it's really highlighted now. And so that miscommunication and miscoordination is really they don't understand our, our space of healthcare and how we operate and what our limitations are and you know what our clinical competencies are and what kind of care we provide and all of that stuff can be improved if we engage with these folks uh before the next disaster rather than um you know trying to do it during the middle of the disaster so for my improvement plan i would say i'm going to make sure that i attend every healthcare coalition meeting 
whether it be virtual or in person. I want to know each and every one of these people and who's going to be making the decisions uh, should this uh, happen again. Who should I call for resources? All of those things really can be kind of gathered from those healthcare coalition uh, meetings. All of the objectives, all of the activities, everything that I've listed out is a part of what those healthcare coalitions are supposed to do. Um, so what we can do is maintain constant situational awareness, do, get, do better about planning and practicing and exercising with our partners that are not um, other skilled nursing partners, but folks in public health and on the acute spectrum. So I think for what we can look at and what we can control is how we plan, prepare, and exercise for the next disaster um, and how we can maintain constant situational awareness. Those are the things that we can control. We can control, um, you know, how well or how poorly somebody else does th their uh, their functions. And uh, so I, I went on <laughs> a little bit more, but hopefully that answers the questions. All right, so we've got no further questions, uh, guys. I'm gonna have um, the gentleman that um, uh, spoke about airflow um, management and um, the industrial hygienist we had on last month. I'm gonna have him on again in two weeks. We're gonna really talk about um, looking at your physical space um, when we do uh, our after action review. Um, this will be um, probably good information for your um, maintenance staff. So we'll record it and we'll keep this on the website so that, um, so that you know, maybe your maintenance can't, staff can't watch it now, but maybe they could go to YouTube and, and watch some of this stuff. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we will see you next week. Um, my hope is we'll have some final changes to those two AFLs, 22.6 or 22.6 and 08.2. So stay tuned. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks very much for joining us and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.